50-year-old a 50 year old uh, female who has a past medical history of rectal cancer. Oh, my screen disappeared for a second. Uh, who, who's coming in with complaints of uh, nausea, vomiting, epigastric abdominal pain, which is worse postprandially, and has been having this for about a few months, but uh, acute symptoms started about uh, three to five days ago. Prior to this, a uh, patient has a history of uh, rectal cancer, status post-radiation, chemotherapy, and surgical resection back in 2010, and um, also has a 45-pack year smoking history. So she reported decreased oral intake over the past 15 years from this pain with an associated weight loss of 40 to 50 pounds over the past year and then reported decrease oral intake over the past 15 years with this pain. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going over the same thing again. Uh, patient didn't have any uh, fevers, chills, no diarrhea, no constipation uh, during this time. Should I stop there? Yeah, Ravi, this is, this is incredibly helpful and actually not uncommon for us to think about. Um, and I think, you know, what's complicating about this case is the time course is a little bit nebulous. You know, when someone presents with such extremis, you expect the time course to be acute and there appears to be a chronic dimension to this case. And so in the back of my mind, I'd be thinking, is this an acute on chronic presentation or is this simply a chronic disease boiling to the surface and presenting as acute because there's no longer any tolerance of this pathology by the patient? But the practical approach really quickly is actually to immediately start to try to localize the lesion. And epigastric pain is very tricky. In fact, any pain that occurs at, at, at the intersection of two body cavities is very tricky. When people have shoulder pain at the juncture between their extremity and their thorax, it could be an extremity problem or a thorax problem. When people have hip pain or lower abdominal pain, it could be from the leg or from the belly. And when you have epigastric pain, the question is, is it actually thoracic in origin, like an acute myocardial infarction, or is it upper abdominal in origin? And um, the, the progress we tend to make is to study the accompanying symptoms to have an educated guess about where the origin may be with any symptoms related to exercise intolerance, prioritizing thoracic pathology, or any symptoms related to ingestion problems, pr prioritizing abdominal pathology. And so here the needle moves towards the abdomen simply because the patient reports discomfort with eating. Um, but that is not uh, enough of a deflection of the needle to lock it into that place. And so for me, I'm activating my schema for postprandial abdominal pain as a guide to the landscape of epigastric pain. And the epigastric pain checks off organs in the chest and the belly and the postprandial dimension just um, highlights some of those diagnoses. And those diagnoses that deserve to be in, in bold really um, are diseases of the lumen, the stomach or the duodenum, diseases of the pancreas, diseases of the biliary system and the vasculature. Uh, the vasculature, um, though all those organs are essentially the, uh, uh, the abdominal digestive organs that are acutely stressed when the patient eats. And so um, which one of them can have a chronic flavor pancreatitis acute on chronic would certainly make sense. Acute on chronic mesenteric ischemia would certainly make sense. And acute on chronic um, luminal pathology, for example, an, uh, an ulcer that bleeds or an ulcer that pops and perforates um, are all plausible. The biliary dimension is less likely to be chronic, um, but that would be the dimension that I would be um, exploring. And then what, the, what does the background history of rectal uh, cancer have to do with this? Um, probably not so much recurrence of disease. Most cases of uh, cancer recurrence of the rectum occur within the first five years of it, but complications from therapy are very fair, very fair game. Fibrotic disease of the lumen or the vessels, chemo delayed chemotherapy, neurological complications, many things. But when we shouldn't be thinking about that right now in the emergency room. What we should be doing is vital signs, exam, EKG, and a basic blood work to get the lay of the land before we make progress. All right, back to you, my friend. Okay, so um, social history they had down, 45 pack year smoking history, surgical history was a surgical resection of the rectal neoplasm in 2010, medications, Symbicor and Buspernone, no allergies, onto the examination.
Okay, vital signs. Sorry, what was that mad again? Oh, never mind. Someone got it. Thank you. Yeah. Ready for the vital signs? Okay, temperature 37, blood pressure 130 over 70, heart rate 85, uh, SATs 99% on room air, general, cachectic appearing BMI of 17 kilograms per meter squared with severe temporal mus muscle wasting. The respiratory cardiovascular exam was normal, gastrointestinal, abdomen was soft, uh, mildly distended in the epigastric region, non-tender, normal bowel sounds, no evidence of peritonitis, no rebound tenderness or guarding. Extremities, no edema, and skin was warm and dry. And then going on to the labs. Uh, sodium 140, potassium 4.3, chloride 99, bicarb 33.7, BUN 21, creatinine 0 0.74, glucose 113, albumin 5.3, total protein 9.4, calcium 10.7, Alkfos 149, AST and ALT was normal, 37 and 29, 37 is the AST, ALT 29, and bilirubin was 0 0.30. CBC, Y count was 6.21. Hemoglobin 13.8, hematocrit 43.2, platelet 457, lactate 2.6. And I'll stop there. Well, Ravi, this is absolutely superb. And uh, for those of you, I know um, Kirtan and Franco are actually preparing a clinical reasoning session, many clinical reasoning sessions, one of which includes uh, some guidance on how to present a case, but I'd love for you to pay close attention to what Ravi is doing. He's so del he's so thoughtful and careful about catching up with the scribe and um, is really highlighting uh, subtly and emphasizing slowly the key parts of this data. Um, so thank you, Ravi. This is awesome. I think it's very helpful for us. And I know all of our minds are actually trying to solve the problem and trying to get an answer, but I want you for, for practice to imagine what it was like walking into this patient's room. You might've heard from somebody else, hey, you have a patient here in the emergency room who's nauseous, vomiting and have abdominal pain. And you walk in the room and you see somebody who was cachectic with a BMI of 17. Think about what that does to you in the moment. It tells you that this patient's syndrome is certainly has some chronic syndrome going on to have this BMI. And so in the back of your mind, you're wondering, um, what, are, what could be causing such profound weight loss? Um, and, and you're probably going to make the inference that it is related to something that's going on today. And you have to be very careful with that. That today may be true, true, and unrelated to what's going on. It may be related to a unifying disease process. So let's just say that something caused her to lose weight and now is causing her to be an extremist right now. She has an, something that is causing her to be an acute extremist unrelated to her weight loss, or most nuanced of all, she has a complication of the weight loss itself. And we'll talk about that final point at the end. Um, it's not too shocking that we haven't made tremendous progress on where this problem is with the, with the, the labs that we have now. It's, um, the chronic pancreatitis won't show up with an elevated lipase necessarily. There's a subtle signal towards hepatobiliary disease with the alk thoughts, but it's so mild that I probably wouldn't be dropping my anchor there. Um, mes mesenteric ischemia, oof, this is pain out of proportion, right? This is a patient who has mild epigastric pain, but is reporting much more pain than we elicit. And so the possibility of mesenteric ischemia certainly uh, uh, needs to be invoked. So um, we'd still probably want to make sure that our EKG is, um, is something that we obtain at some point. Um, but again, the nature of this pain is a little bit less likely to be compatible with coronary disease. 
So the more negatives we have the, uh, about the biliary system, the pancreas, the more the vascular hypothesis goes up and the more the luminal hypothesis go up. And the luminal, I mean pathology within or around the stomach and the duodenum. Um, so what would be next for this patient? I think you need to assess the vessel hypothesis with cross-sectional imaging after you get your EKG. And that's probably the only way you can make tremendous progress. But in the back of your mind, you're probably thinking, wait, what's the deal with this weight loss? And um, the weight loss, I think quite simply, you can think about it as there's not enough calories coming into the body or the calories are being consumed more than they usually are. And the latter is essentially because of inflammation. And then a quick screen for evidence of inflammation here shows that there doesn't appear to be any. The white count is normal. The hemoglobin is normal. There's no anemia of chronic disease. The patient doesn't report any inflammatory syndromes. And the truth is, if you, if there's a disconnect here, for a patient to have an inflammatory syndrome resulting in a BMI of 17, you'd expect the markers of inflammation to not be subtle. And the fact that we have to dig this deep to find markers of inflammation is telling that there might not be any. And so this, this seems to be a calorie in problem, be it because of access to food or, or discomfort with eating food or depression or um, um, uh, mental illness or um, absorption issues. And it goes back to that, that postprandial dimension that we, the patient doesn't seem to be digesting their calories very well. So I think imaging is an order and will probably be very informative. If not, you almost certainly need endoscopy for this patient. But I wanna arm you with one possibility that might, might make things a little bit more complicated. And that possibility might be, oh, one sec, sorry. Um, that possibility might be um, that the patient actually has a, has a cause acutely of her weight loss. Uh, that, that the syndrome might not be the result of anything, uh, the underlying cause of her weight loss, but rather the weight loss itself. So what can weight loss do to the world of abdominal pain and discomfort? When the patient has no fat in her belly because of her low BMI, it may make CTs falsely negative because there's no fat to strand. We rely a lot on fat stranding to pick up things in the belly. And so we have to be very careful. A negative CT here may mean that there, because there's no fat stranding, maybe because there's just no fat at all. But more acutely, the big complications are um, to think about uh, stone disease. So gallstones are at higher risk in patients who are, um, who are poorly nourished. But the most important complication to know of is what's called SMA syndrome. The fat pad that keeps the SMA above the duodenum, separated from the duodenum, erodes when the patient loses weight and suddenly the SMA can compress the duodenum. So I'd be specifically making sure that that's not going on here today to make sure we're not distracted by complications of the weight loss itself. And I'll show you a schema in a second. But if we're thinking in real life, you see this patient, you don't have an answer, you need an answer because she's too, she's too sick. EKG, CT, and then maybe endoscopy afterwards. All righty, back to you, Ravi. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I don't have the EKG. I think it, it was normal. Um, at one point, it was uh, the heart rate was 85, uh, sin normal sinus rhythm. I have imaging, if I'm able to share the screen. Someone, oh, okay. I just need you okay. co-host, yep, you should be good to go. All right. And are you able to see the CTs? Yes. Okay, so with it, we have the transverse view here and you see the, the stomach here. Is there anything that catches your eye? Yeah, you know, um, I gotta, I gotta admit my confidence about reading CTs is low. Um, and it's something that I'm actively practicing right now. So for the last two months, I've made it, a, um, made it a, a point to try to look at all my CTs. And the truth is, even though everyone in the world told me to beforehand, I never did. Um, what's catching my eye is um, how low the BMI is, how little adipose tissue there is. And then my reflex association is that the stomach seems to um, be a little dilated, but I've been faked out by that. What is more impressive is that there is an air fluid level and that air fluid level shouldn't be there because there should be, unless the patient just ate any food in the stomach, should have moved on. So this is concerning to me for a, a degree of gastric outlet obstruction or gastric immotility. So basically things aren't moving out of the stomach, either because there's a block or the things that propel food to the stomach are not, are not working. Um, 
And most causes of gastric outlet obstruction are things on the inside of the stomach, like um, peptic ulcer disease, or rarely things that patients ingest, like um, bezoars or parasites. Um, uh, not uncommonly, though, there's things on the outside, and we talked about SMA syndrome and other things. But importantly, in a patient with a low BMI, the possibility of idiopathic gastroparesis is also uh, warranted. It's something that um, we, we think about a lot in patients with eating disorders who get um, gastroparesis, but it'd be something on my mind. But the next step is to make sure there's no mechanical obstruction on the outside or on the inside. So uh, that's your deduction is uh, right on the the the, the money uh, there, Robbie. Like uh, he, when you see the um, coronal section here, and you see the superior mesentic ar artery, uh, there is the loss of the fat pad here, and with the extreme amount of cachexia, so the patient initially had the cancer, and then had loss of weight. There is compression of the superior. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or I guess the duodenum with the, by the superior mesenteric artery. So the next step was to do a upper GI series and it showed abnormal delayed passage of barium through the third portion of the duodenum suggesting SMA syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so you completely cr correct with your analysis there. Probably this, this, uh, this case is humbling because it, sh it shows you that um, the path to the current diagnosis can be so complicated. Like who knew you can get a disease just from weight loss alone? And um, yeah, so our chain of reasoning is um, this person has a weight loss syndrome. We don't know why she lost weight and the weight loss itself resulted in the SMA syndrome. And um, I'm curious, Ravi, how were the, how, how were the investigations to um, to uncover the original insult, the cause of the weight loss? Did they, were they productive in any way? Did they lead you to a, a path or how did that go? Um, unfortunately, I don't have that information, that's but what I know, what I do know that they did, um, at least, um, you know, initially the, the management, uh, is to try and increase the weight yeah. that way you reverse the, the, uh, loss of that fat pad there, or try and reinstate the fat pad that was, uh, that was missing there initially. Uh, so that I don't think worked, but you can, you can start certain, um, modification in diet or. Uh, augment the diet with TPN. You also have to be careful about refeeding syndrome in, yeah. in a patient like this, as an aside. Yeah. Uh, surgical intervention, I think, is the the last uh, mm. um, intervention, I would say. But um, sometimes um, I think I've heard of people putting in stents or other things to try and alleviate this, uh, which may be helpful. But in this case, I, I, actually, I didn't see this patient, but um, I, see. I could That's follow weird. up on what, what the outcome was with this patient. Thank you. I mean, it's incredible. You're presenting a case that you heard about in one of your reports. So, so cool. What, what stuck with you? What, uh, I imagine this case made an imprint when you first heard about it. Clearly, you're presenting it here. What did you take away from it? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Even in reading about it, uh, it's commonly missed. And uh, there was actually a poster presentation I was a judge of. And oh. uh, one of the, it was a, uh, a resident from Walter Reed, Army Medical Center that presented it. It was a veteran that was for many years bouncing around and had this diffuse abdominal tenderness and had the tenderness in the epigastrum and was misdiagnosed. So, you know, here with uh, us uh, participating in this uh, daily video morning report, we're trying to at least prevent misdiagnosis. So this case stuck out to me and it reminded me of this resident's case from uh, Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center. Uh, the case was uh, uh, titled as the gut cracker syndrome. Mm -hmm. So we know about nutcracker, right? right. It, it immediately brings your thought to nutcracker syndrome with the the, the renal artery uh, in that case. But with this, it, it is sort of like a gut cracker syndrome yeah. if you if you think. So this patient was diagnosed uh, with uh, superior mesenteric artery syndrome. And I was like, you know, I don't commonly see that, but I made it, uh, uh, you know, uh, made it uh, 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 at least uh, something that I would think about in the future, uh, that way not misdiagnose or miss somebody that comes in with abdominal pain. Of course, we have many patients that come in with abdominal pain and we, we, we have a more obvious diagnosis, but this is something that I want to at least put in the yeah. forefront of my mind and not miss because it can, it can, you know, it, it could actually uh, severely be, it, it could severely result in a terrible outcome for the patient with more 
uh, progressive weight loss and, and uh, malnutrition and other uh, issues with, with uh, severe weight loss. So um, that case, actually, I think uh, what I remember from that, from that uh, case, so that poster was, it required a multidisciplinary approach, uh, you know, with GI pathology, surgery, uh, nutrition as well, in order to bulk up the patients or increase the patient's PO intake, and then uh, resolve it uh, via, via um, non-invasive measures. But yeah, that was basically what I re rem remembered about this case and what I learned about this case. And I'm look at you, you're spreading that, that wisdom to many more people today. Really, really appreciate it. And I love the term gut cracker syndrome. It will stick with me forever. Um, you know, I think um, this, this case is a great reminder to, um, to have, a, have a lot of diagnostic humility because I can see how you're like, oh, finally, I can figure out what's causing this patient's weight loss. Like she's here, she's had weight loss, will never be able to figure it out. And all of a sudden she has such localizing symptoms to her GI tract. And you're like, oh, I bet the answer is there. And you always have to be humble to the possibility that the answer may not be there. And you're simply suffering a consequence of the weight loss itself. And I've, I've, I've been in this space a couple of times. It's not such a, it's not a common scenario, but I just want you to see the lay of the land. Um, so the, the um, complications of weight loss I just want you to focus on this. There's many other things, but the loss of the fat pad can result in SMA syndrome and less commonly in immediate argument ligament syndrome. We won't have time to elaborate on what these what the other things are. Patients with weight loss are more likely to have the loss of the protective fat pad that protects GI contents from going into the obturator hernia as you get more obturator hernias. And as we talked about, there's no fat to strand on CT, so your diagnostic utility goes down. And you can take a quick glance at all the other things you have to think about. But I think the biggest thing, when you see a patient with an acute syndrome complicated by weight loss, don't assume that the acute syndrome is going to unreveal 10 years of mystery. It may reveal just the complication of the loss of the fat itself. Um, and I think Robbie's case is a brilliant reminder of that. All righty. Well, you know, it's a, it's a first of many, a first to SMA syndrome on VMR, I think, but also Danya's first time ever doing the teaching points, which we're very, very excited um, for her to, um, for her to take that leap. It's always an anxiety provoking one, but I was actually glancing at the points that she's dotted down and I think they're absolutely superb and I can't wait for her to summarize the case. All right. So bear with me guys this is my first time trying to do teaching points. All right, so this was a really interesting case. I loved it. I've actually seen one case of SMA syndrome myself and um, had a very similar presentation to this and made me wonder, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So whenever um, we uh, uh, have a case with us uh, that presents with nausea, vomiting, and epigastric pain, I think the first um, thing that you uh, one should do is think of pathologies inside of the GI tract um, that may be causing it, like something wrong, uh, something that is um, in the stomach, maybe an ulcer or um, any biliary tract problem, or maybe something else, uh, or any vascular problem, um, like a mesenteric ischemia leading to um, uh, chronic uh, postprandial pain, or maybe something outside the, of the GI tract, which can lead to obstruction. And then some any complication of any chronic illnesses, for example, maybe um, uh, like the patient had um, a malignancy and then they were treated with any uh, medicines or chemotherapy leading to fibrosis and that may be a, a cause of it, right? Uh, then the second thing that we should um, probe further into is whether this condition that the patient has presented with is an acute illness or, a, or an acute presentation or maybe acute on chronic. Uh, so I guess we'll have to um, uh, really focus on our history taking. Then another thing that Rabi uh, uh, talked about was um, localizing the pain. So whenever uh, a pain occurs at juncture of two locations, it's kind of tricky because, for example, like we had epigastric pain, we need to think uh, we need to rule out either thoracic causes, um, maybe an MI or an um, a ruptured um, abdominal uh, thoracic aorta or um, upper abdominal pathologies. Uh, the same goes with shoulder pain and there are many other uh, examples. Um, we can go on and on about those. Um, I uh, just mentioned uh, we need to localize and I think um, I mentioned this before in my first point. Um, another thing that we need to, need, um, to focus on is um, what is the, the uh, intensity of the pain? So if pain is mild, 
It may be a biliary pathology, for example, if it is pain out of proportion, we need to look further into vascular causes because they usually present with pain out of proportion. Um, what else? Uh, there was mention of weight loss, right? So we uh, know from our endless sessions of uh, virtual monitoring reports that whenever there is weight loss, we need to see if there is um, inadequate intake versus excessive use of uh, calories, right? So um, when we probe further into it, we'd probably uh, be able to find out that weight loss may be a complication of the disease process, but it can also be a cause of the patient's symptoms. So in uh, the uh, presentation that we had, the problems were a cause of the weight loss. We uh, probably would want to uh, take history and try to find out as to why the patient had excessive weight loss. But uh, this particular weight loss led to um, pain out of proportion because of obstruction of the duodenum, also a GI uh, obstruction, GI tract obstruction that is caused by a syndrome which is known as the superior mesenteric artery syndrome or SMA syndrome that uh, results when uh, there is loss of fat pad that uh, sort of protects uh, the duodenum, but when that is lost, the compression of the duodenum between aorta and superior mesenteric artery leads to a GI tract obstruction, uh, um, outlet obstruction, and that may uh, cause excessive epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting. It is very similar to nutcracker syndrome that is actually the obstruction of the renal vein between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. Yeah, so. Oh, that's amazing. Are... Thank you so much, a superb recap. And I love that. Uh, I love that you've experienced this yourself to uh, bring your uh, case back to life too. All right, y'all. It was a delight hanging out with you. Um, we're actually going to do uh, VMR tomorrow at a little bit earlier, one hour earlier than usual, so at eight a.m. Pacific uh, with Reza and I. And hope to see you all there. Bye.